Hello everybody, this is Ominous for Responsible Gaming doing episode 3, where's the camera? Here, of uh, The Responsibles. Uh, today we are reviewing, after episode 1 was a book, uh, Ready Player One, episode 2 was Gone Home, hi, uh, video game. <laughs> now we're doing Stranger Things, um, so first of all, let me introduce the cast. We have one returning host, which is Tan Tansbot, you can find us this year. Hello. Hi. I'm excited to be back to talk about Stranger Things. Awesome show, loved it, so looking forward to chatting about it. Spoiler, she liked it. <laughs> okay, uh, and we have one new uh, cast member, uh, Nematron Eric Newman. Great to have you. Hello. Hey, guys. Hello, Internet. So we have many Internets following us already. Um, actually, I want to chat in so that I can see what is being said said um, very well. So, Stranger Things, um, in case you haven't heard of it a million times yet, this is a Netflix original uh, series, like it's written in the bottom actually, over here um, of the stream, um, and it's uh, been out for just a couple months and it's quite the phenomenon. Um, what I want to do today is try and start with uh, trailer so that if you have no idea what we're talking about you're gonna be able to see it and you're gonna be introduced to the trailer uh, we're gonna do um, we're gonna do a non-spoiler part to this show first so don't you worry just yet uh, and this is just the trailer so you should be good so let's check it out that's the real thing I just love that music. Hawkins I don't know the worst thing that's ever happened here in the four years I've been working here was when an owl attacked Eleanor Gillespie's head because it thought that her hair was a nest. Out of a hundred times, kid goes missing. The kid is with a parent or a relative. Well, what about the other time? What? You said 99 out of a hundred. What about the other time? The one! Out in July. The, the trailer is, is uh, already something to spend quite some time on, I think, because it, it's pretty sweet. Um, yeah, no, that was cool. Uh, I, it's the first time I do the trailer uh, at the same time, so I'll definitely be interesting for the audio version, and I don't really know the quality of the stream, but um, that was pretty cool, huh? Yeah, that was cool. I actually hadn't seen it. Oh, really? It's a very good trailer, yeah. Uh, the, the companies doing this are, are little, little movie companies on, of their own, aren't they? Yeah, I, I usually don't watch any trailers because they these days they spoil so so much, mm. um, and I'm I'm already such a fiend for predicting the endings of stuff. I just like I don't want anything except what's in the, the actual piece itself. That's interesting. But, yeah, yeah, for sure, definitely. Yeah, this one was was pretty well done. So, um, in the interest of um, of uh, keeping it spoiler 
uh, spoiler free to begin with um, we're gonna try and uh, discuss a little bit the way the movie uh, uh, the movie huh the TV show has been uh, shot and kind of the, the the cinematography perhaps the actors as well uh, and I think we, we can debate uh, the the characters a little later on and, and then move on to um, to spoiler territory um, so the TV show not a movie as it is um, is solid I would say it's very it's very uh, tightly uh, packaged and 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 filmed uh, what do you think yeah I mean I, I actually think it's really funny that you accidentally called it a movie because oh, yeah. it's, it's so clearly like an, an 80s movie chopped up into a TV show mm -hmm. you know um, and they, they did a lot a lot of work to nail down the, uh, the the tiniest tiniest little details that anybody like I mean I, I was born in the mid 80s I, I'm, I guess a 90s kid but I, I watched a ton of 80s movies if you watch that kind of stuff, like if you watch Stand By Me, E.T., The Goonies, mm -hmm. etc., you know, actually probably my favorite one is, uh, uh, oh man, I can't believe I'm blanking on it right now. I'll think of it later. But, uh, you know, they nailed down all of the little details of these things. They got the film grain, they got the props, they got the cinematography, and this one of the things that the internet is like buzzing about is like that optically made, uh, Main title. What do you guys think about that main title? Main title? Yeah, like the in the first shot where you see the Stranger Things and it's those like crazy red letters. Oh yeah. That, that was I. I'm pretty sure that was made. If it wasn't actually made the, the old-fashioned optical way, it was certainly done to emulate uh, this old technology where they would literally like use film and f optically move it towards the camera. Like they used to actually yeah. film yeah. headings like that. Yeah, I think it's been, it looks to me like it's been branded, somebody picked up that they had something very strong to market and this this like very st strong graphic uh, impression of this this uh, old fashioned um, science fiction, uh, you know, kind of scary title. Just is just all, like the title itself evoked so many things for so many people. It has Stephen King written all yeah, over it too. Absolutely. Like, those old books, yeah. and it has that, that red font, and that the type of the font type that they use. It just evokes that feeling. In fact, it's really funny because when I was watching it, um, when we were watching it, in fact, um, a friend who had no idea what we were watching came in and the title was coming on. She was like, oh, what are you guys watching? Something from the 80s about Stephen King? She was able to just pick up on it like instantly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested. I think I've seen I've seen like there is probably a bunch of articles about the actual history of of this this font and this title. Um, I wonder if there is there's probably even more to it than the Stephen King. It's like a, an entire era of like kind of scary uh, books, uh, um, kind of kind of kind of feel to it, right? Yeah, one of one of the other artists uh, from the '80s that a lot of people were were saying it's a very strong reference to is John Carpenter. Right, who right. did things like The Thing, and uh, you know, I think he did It too, and uh, you know, that Big Trouble, Little China, not so spooky, but still like had that that opening, that intro, especially oh, with that uh, that crazy synth wave music. Yeah, I think yeah, you probably you probably find like we just shared a um, a link uh, in the chat, and yeah, the, there is yeah, there's definitely a. I, I think that's the article I was uh, I was seeing. I'll I'll put a bunch of links uh, in the show notes so people can can look up a little bit. But yeah, that's definitely a very strong um, element, and and um, and the trailer is as well. Like the trailer was just blasting with images that that seem familiar to to everybody, and just like of all this this throwback of of eighties uh, kids adventure. It's more than just the images, right? Like you just mentioned um, John Carpenter, and it's like it's that audio, that musical score too. It's like super synth based, and it's um, synth that wave. Um, yeah, <laughs> you were trying to talk about that, <laughs> like right there for you. Yeah. But yeah, no, that music that it evokes that like kind of '80s horror feeling, kind of makes you think of like Halloween or something, um, which I think is also Carpenter. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that's been fascinating me about this is that, like, 
you know, I have long been an 80s obsessive or, or really just kind of an obsessive of many, many yeah. things. But, uh, you know, at my interest in movie scores long ago brought me to this medium called synthwave, which is like basically an entire genre of music that's just designed to sound like synth 80s soundtracks. And what's fascinating is that like the internet has been blowing up about, uh, you know, like synthwave and all of these people uh, who discovered synthwave just because they went and they looked up the Stranger Things theme and went to listen to it and yeah. like Spotify or YouTube or whatever suggested it. They were like, oh, you like this? Well, you'll like synthwave. And now synthwave is trending like crazy worldwide. That sort of happened to me too. So I was just like, I didn't even say the word synthwave right now. I said synth based. So I did the same thing. I went online and I sort of started looking up, like, you know, what is their name for this type of music? What is it called? And that's how I discovered it. So I totally, it's introducing, like, it's music that's been around that's so, like, reminiscent of a certain genre and a certain time period to a lot of people in a brand new way right now. Oh, interesting. I don't think I even picked up on the music all that much, to be honest. Oh, it's so I, good. I, no, yeah. no way. I remember the, um, yeah, I remember the, like, quiet yeah wavy sound one of them i remember one of them i mean right from the intro like the way the the way yeah but that's the one i remember mostly yes music, it comes in the background the whole score for the entire show is pretty freaking awesome okay and it's it's so refreshing too because like pretty much since the movie inception came out every single action or drama movie has just been like Bwah. What? Wow. It's funny to say that because <laughs> at the very end of the trailer, at the very least, they give into some of that. Like I was like, oh yeah, there's still a little bit of that. Like when there is like the flashes in the shed, uh, the the music goes like. Uh, well, what is it? It's, what it's is the wow? Not a horn, and yeah. literally sure. everybody else has been using like sure. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On bone sound or whatever. <laughs> so. Um, well, should we should we try and 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 nitpick and figure out the little um, the little details about this because the cinematography of the eighties, I I have to say, in parts, it looks very obvious. I mean, I don't know if there's a little bit of of uh, acceptance that you have to have like um, a, maybe I don't know if it's campy, but it's definitely eighties to the max. Like you 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 can see that it's it is selling you. Look at this Goonies uh, type of uh, band of kids that are going to be going on this adventure. It's like it's just there. Like you really want to, you really have to uh, get in for it, right? Yeah. I, yeah, but I don't mind the sort of in your sure. face. Like you feel super immersed in it. You can tell that you can tell it's very obvious, right? Like there's no subtlety about it. But I I don't mind it because it's done so well. It's really enjoyable, and I mean they they kind of got it right. So it's like I'm fine with all the like in your face references just thrown all over the place, the super eighties ambiance all around. Yeah, I mean I think they, they really set up the cinematography uh in that first shot in the basement, right? Which really is like the oh sorry, am I allowed to talk about this? This isn't a spoiler, right? Just talking about the very yeah. first scene. So the very first scene right there, they're in the basement, they're playing Dungeons and Dragons, the the main character kids. And it, it really is like a, a whole foreshadowing scene that, that sets up the entire story. But it also sets up the entire cinemagraphic uh, sort of like configuration. Mm -hmm. right? They have this nice wide shot that shows the whole table from both sides. You have kids sort of sitting around it, except no kid with their back to us. right? So what that shows us right away is that this show is like, it's, it's not pretending that it's not a movie which is something that is very common today in 2016. It's like, we're so influenced by reality TV mm -hmm. and like shaky, you know, Blair Witch Project camera shots. There's none of that, right? There's no moment in the whole show where the, the camera goes shaky. There's no moment in the whole show where you feel like you're inside of a reality, right? Like, it's always like yeah. a movie, right? It's, yeah, it's, feel that entertainment factor, like you are watching a film or something. Yeah, you're external to it. You know what, you guys, maybe you can help me think of this, because you started talking about how like the intro scene kind of foreshadows um, the, le the rest of the plot. And that's Still without mm, quite spoiling just yet? Sure, yeah, without spoiling anything. 
Um, well, <laughs> well, I'll hold. I don't know how you would do that. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. All right, I'll hold. I'll hold. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, so one thing that I just thought of though, as well, is that part of the cinematography as well. Again, mostly keeping it spoiler free with the science fiction uh, aspect of it. Uh, I think you get that from the trailer. I think it's pretty clear from the title as well. Yeah. Um, uh, it's uh, kind of kind of kind of more like '90s sci-fi and a little more X Filesy, a little more like actual uh, science. Well, I, I guess I, I might not have seen that many sci-fi movies from the '80s, but um. Like, I, I felt it less um, 40, or 30, 40 years in the past uh, on the sci-fi aspect of it. I don't know. I felt like super influenced by Aliens. Um, not a spoiler again, just like I felt like the movie Aliens. Like okay. a lot of the cinematography and a lot of like the visuals. I felt like there was this, uh, I don't know, it just reminded me of it. It was like, oh wow, like they're really kind of giving like an homage or a nod of the head. Uh, point of contention for me, I don't think it's sci-fi. I don't think it's sci-fi at all. I think it's strictly a fantasy show in a, you know, 80s contemporary setting. Um, you know, they set the whole scene with Dungeons and Dragons. They're constantly making these allegories back and forth about how, you know, uh, there are the, the monster <laughs> type See, characters. I, I honestly <laughs> let's let's go back to this one as well because if we're dense around it, we're uh, I think we can go deeper uh, when we when we say exactly what we're talking about. This is a good uh, this is a good one uh, topic to come back to. Um, so yeah, so cinematography pretty solid. I, yeah, I don't think it's I don't think it's I don't think it's in your face. Um, fancy cinematography either like I don't think it's trying super hard to establish crazy impressive shots and and narration uh, uh, devices and etc I think it's just very tightly packaged like in a in a kind of mastered you know things are there for a reason things are nicely shot but they're it's mostly straightforward I feel yeah, yeah. I mean what one of the things that I think was also really nice is that the, the cuts are slow the cuts are real slow as compared to like what you would see in 2016, uh -huh. which, which again is a nice, subtle nod that non-cinematographic obsessives would never notice consciously. Yeah. But you know, yeah. as an unconscious thing, you, when you see this show, when a cut takes, you know, the, the typical cut time is like, I don't know, maybe maybe like 10 seconds long, whereas like in 2016, your typical cut times are much much shorter than that. So without saying a word, without ever putting something specifically on screen, just by like slowing it down a little bit, it gives it this old feeling, yeah, which of course makes sense because like in the 80s, people were cutting things by hand still. They weren't using computers. They couldn't do tons and tons of cuts and, yeah. and see them instantly and make sure that everything was perfect. So like slower it's cuts. It's something I didn't key in on. It wasn't like, it's not like I was actively watching it saying, oh, wow, these cuts are, you know, they're taking their time. It's slow. But I feel like it really helped, like, set the mood of the show. We, we're we not all Numatron level cinematic. <laughs> 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 I did feel like I appreciated it without even putting it into those words. I remember thinking, like, I really liked the pace of the show. I really liked, like, the cadence. And I think, yeah. like, as you said it, those long cuts, I think they really lend it to that. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say that for as well the structure of what is um, uh, like in the episodes. Like it's not a uh, jam-packed of action, uh, uh, cliffhanger every single one episode type of show either. Like it doesn't feel like you're running and getting thrown uh, uh, events and things and actions uh, to your face constantly. Uh, it, it feels much like uh, more. Like uh, it's not tiring. Like it's not a binge. Like where you just like, oh my god, so many things have happened. Like the thing is cool. You can get excited. The, the show is good, but it's not like, you know, uh, get your your heart rate up uh, every thirty seconds type of show. Well, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not plumbing. You like plumbing your face with nonstop action. It's the, it's really narrative based. I, I like that. It's like a story. It's unfolding over these episodes. Yeah. So. Can we, since well, since we're discussing characters, can we discuss like my one point of contention? 
because um, I love almost everything about the show. I almost thought like I shouldn't even do this podcast because I won't have anything to say, but I love it. But um, Winona Ryder's acting, like she really overdid it. Like compared to how natural the kids were and how natural the other characters sort of felt, I felt like it really stood out, like her hysteria. It just felt like so overacted. And I, I just want to know what you guys think. She's supposed to be a mother who lost her kid. I you know, know, like I get it, I get it. All sympathies, but he's just so hysterical. It was yeah. like how so many kids do you have and have been a uh, whatever happens to some kid in the show? No. Just so over the top though. Yeah. I don't I just couldn't She didn't... she screams and like people could be devastated and devastated, people could be in denial or I don't know. Um I, I mean I think it's part of the, the narration though, like she's supposed to to come off crazy to uh, most people, so yeah, that's probably she's helping with that. She's, su um, she's supposed to be on the edge, yeah. right? Like part of the part of the storyline, without exposing anything, part of the storyline does hinge on people doubting her sanity. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There's part of that, I, and I mean, you could still you could still totally hold it against uh, hold it against her how she enacted going crazy like I get that it got irritated for you I tend to be irritated sometimes I don't remember it finding that she was that annoying in her uh, um, unhingedness I suppose but she yeah she she definitely enacted it for real I mean I, I thought she crushed it and again like for me so much of this is just going to come back over and over again about like how they nailed this 80s movie thing right just her presence in the movie of all, of all the actors that they selected, it's true. That's true. She's she's the only actor who was actually famous for being in these kind of movies in the eighties. She's the only actor who was famous at all, right? Right. Or, right. Well, actually, the guy who plays the sheriff is like yeah, I've seen you know, before. You, you recognize him from other stuff. Right, but, but not uh, the same level. And then you like yeah, Winona Ryder is like you know her from the eighties. Yeah, I mean everybody knows her yeah. from yeah. the eighties. And she, by the way, she's. She's in that movie that you said this show made you think of. She's in, she's in one of the Alien movies. That's right. <laughs> that's so right. I was like, what is she in? I don't actually. That's not the person I recognize the most. Uh, not even remotely. We're not right there. I don't. I don't have a big, uh, extensive memory of her filmography. I can't. Um, I can't think of her. I can only think of her in that terrible '90s movie, Girl Interrupted. Okay. Hey. Like, oh, hey. I'm sorry. Uh oh. <gasps> Sore point? <laughs> I mean, that excellent film from the 90s. <laughs> well, well, it's I'm a quickie. Not IMDb her. What's that? I'm just going to look up what, what she's You look in. her up? Oh, she, yeah. She's going to be in. Like, she's in a ton things. of stuff. Yeah. Also, yeah. She, she yeah. looks great. Not that that's like really super important here, but no, she no, does she, look great. She looks fabulous. Oh, yeah. She's in Beetlejuice. <laughs> She's in a freaking Beetlejuice, right? That's like yeah. a parody of these kind of 80s movies about kids getting into trouble and their parents not understanding, right? Like, she's in that. Uh, by the way, IMDb says Beetlejuice 2 is announced? Yeah, I think I've heard of that. Yeah. Put a cork in that. Yeah. Uh, it's probably going to have Johnny Depp in it. <laughs> oh, God. I know, exactly. That sounds true, though. That's very scary. Reality Bites. Oh, yeah, Reality Bites. Heathers, of course. Heathers was her big, big movie. Which oh, is maybe I haven't seen any movie which she's in. <laughs> oh, dude, Heathers is a great movie. Oh, yes. <laughs> huh? But yeah, I think, I think her biggest ones are Heathers, Reality Bites, uh, Beetlejuice, and... The alien movie that she was in. No, no, and it's not like it's not like she was terrible or anything. I mean, I so in preparing to do this, you know, do this um, stream, I was trying to think of like possible criticisms and like asking around, like what people thought, what people's opinions were, and so forth. Um, and like one thing I could come up with, I think, was her overacting. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's going to be a, a point of contention, anyways, because somebody acting acting. Um, uh, uh, under anguish and unhinged and and screaming after their child, uh, you're probably uh, 
you're probably gonna have more people liking or not liking the way they come up when they do that. As someone who really has, yeah. you know, yeah. kind of cannot relate on any level to that loss. Yeah, there okay. is, um, I'll say that the uh, kid actors were doing great most of the time. I, huh? They crushed it. I yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll, honestly, uh, I felt a bunch of times, uh, I could see a couple, a bunch of times that here and there they were like, oh, they didn't, they didn't get that many takes of this Portugal scene with this, uh, with this young actor, not, not particularly nailing it all that much to me. Um, either that or they went really for the real genuine, this is how kids talk just in that Portugal instance. Because in the rest of the movie, like in any uh, TV show, <laughs> like in any TV show or movie, they talk like they're masters of speech and they have all the, the sentences and etc. But every now and then they say something and like, oh, hey, you sound like a kid right there, you know? Um, yeah. It doesn't come off like West Wing or something like that or like Gilmore Girls. It's, it, it's more like the Goonies. You yeah. know? It's more like this sort of raw kid kid thing. Yeah, I didn't... I don't know the name of the kids, unfortunately, which I probably should. Um, I didn't feel like uh, when they were... Well, let's see. What's their name? What's their name? So we can name them. Uh, which which one? Which character? Which one are you thinking of? My favorite one was uh, Mike Wheeler. He's the one with the lisp. He was amazing. Ben Wolfhard. Ben Wolfhard. So Mike Wheeler is the one with the lisp. Yeah, Mike is the one with the lisp. can barely see them. Caleb McLaughlin is Lucas Sinclair. Yep, Lucas Sinclair is the one that didn't like Levin. Gaten uh, Matarazzo is like obviously the winner of this show because that guy, he's the, the, the one with the curly hair and the three missing teeth. Oh, who yeah, is, yeah, that's the one. Oh, that's who I thought it was. I, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm saying I love. Is that, well, what's his name in the show? Uh, his name is Caleb, I think. And oh, absolutely no, my too. favorite character. They they wrote him to be your favorite character, right? Like he's he's so smart, he's yeah. so funny, he's so cute, he's, he's got all this heart. Ass. He just yeah. like cast perfectly, written perfectly, acted perfectly. That kid is gonna be a movie star. So that for, for that fighting. one's Dustin. So that's Dustin with the lisp. The uh, um, the one I keep I can barely see their pictures. Um, Oh yeah, I got it confused. I got him confused with Mike Wheeler, who's like, if, if there is like a main character, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Mike, Mike Wheeler is like the main character, right? And he's the one who gets into like the love relationship thing with uh, with Eleven, who is Millie Bobby Brown, who also is going to be, obviously going to be a movie star. Did you see her rapping? <laughs> no. Dude, there, there was a thing where she, she rapped a, a Nicki Minaj bit and it was on some show i don't know i don't know what show it was, but it was all over my facebook okay I see this. well okay yeah. she was channeling her carry she was really channeling her carry right i love it. Well, I, I feel like we're already even on the characters we we can't even really say all that much without getting into the the meat of what actually happens in the can we in the show can we so, draw the line can we yeah. like get into it now yeah i think we're drawing the line i don't think you can we can talk about all that much now we talked about the cinematography and etc um, so how do we throw a pile of spoilers onto all of this? Um, at the very hello, hello, hello. <laughs> the, spoiler time. The very beginning of the well, in the trailer, you see that something very spooky happens to that kid, which is the last one that we didn't mention, uh, which is I think his name is Will. Will. That's Bain. Will. Yeah, yeah. So Will disappears uh, on in the first episode, basically, or or you know he really disappeared uh, like by the second episode, um, so, after being potentially maybe chased by shadows that we don't really know what they are after they they are done with their game of Dungeons and Dragon. Right. It's the Demigorgon, come on. The Demigorgon. I, people will say. Um, um, this is the the, Demi Gorgon. It's just like the Demi Gorgon. I'm I'm trying to not uh, 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 put every spoiler from episode number ten before we talk about that particular plot point, you know. Um, but yeah, like so, yeah, it disappears and then uh, eleven appears very quickly in in like an episode or two after that when they're when they're chasing Will and trying to figure out 
where he is. She just appears uh, in the forest as a completely loner kid that just doesn't really talk very much and, and uh, looks like a bit like a wild animal. No. <laughs> it's a demigorgon, all right. This is the demigorgon right here. Demigorgon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so she, I, yeah, tell me. I guess if we're, I don't know, I think in, if we can relay the plot, of course, but I think, I mean, we should assume, like, most people who have seen it, and we're now, since we're getting into the spoilers, I think there's a couple of interesting things to discuss, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if we're, so we're in the spoiler part, right? Like, I can fully start kind of mentioning stuff. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just saying that just for a somewhat of structure, if you don't want to bounce uh, every direction in, into the, the narration, but that's fine. Yeah, just mention whatever. One of the things that one of the things that I thought was kind of cool was like this whole the whole idea, right, with the upside down the upside down world. There's there's like a philosophic element to it too, because it's like borrowing from like you know like this idea like with Plato has this like theory about you know pe people being trapped in a cave and there's shadows on the walls and. And it just sort of thought like they kind of worked this like multi-layer element into into this like fantasy story, which is essentially like a children's fantasy story, but then it has all these other layers and elements in it. So I thought that was really interesting and well done. Because usually when people try to borrow and like do like the traditional like like Plato's like allegory of the cave thing, it's done in a really trite and painful way. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. I think that, that they brought a lot of really interesting sort of like, they, they didn't call it philosophy, right? They called it science, which was interesting. Yeah, because they, almost... they kept like picking their, their science teacher, right? Who's like kind of this like wacky Bill Nye science guy. Gotcha. Uh, or actually, he, he's more like the science teacher from Sabrina the Teenage Witch, now that I think about it. He's kind of like this put upon science guy who just wants his kids to learn, you know? Um, but he's the guy who they keep calling about this stuff, but you're right. It's very much, like, magical, right? Um, yeah, I... To be honest, I don't, I don't know how much of, how many elements are, are, are tied back to, to the uh, allegories or the philosophy, I think it's kind of a, a a metaphor that you could be using, but I don't know, I don't know how much of this ties to like the the you know kind of reality, not so much reality kind of aspect. Uh, but that that could be interesting. Like, what do you first? Do you take the the entire story for face value, right? The the entire movie is not a metaphor for something else. Like this, those are events that are very spooky and magical that are actually happening, right? Well, so. It's yeah. roughly based on a quote-unquote true story. You guys know about this? Oh, what? Yeah. Dude, so yeah. there's these few people, I think it's these, these two men in particular, who said that they worked on a classified project in New Jersey. And I, I'm taking all this from like a Slate article or something like that. I haven't researched any of this. Mm -hmm. Don't hold me to it. Yeah. But... uh. uh they said that they worked on a, on a classified project during the Cold War that was designed to see about moving things from one place to another by sending them through another dimension. And they said that when they finally figured out how to do this, they, they ended up doing it by using a young child. And the young child was like basically in a floating tank, right? And so like a lot of the elements that made it into the show come from this person's description. Okay. It put the person in, in a sensory deprivation tank. They were somehow able to connect this other space. And that objects were not, at, they were never able to move things into the other space, I think is what you said, or he said. But uh, the child was able to manifest objects from the other space in our space including a monster that got loose on the base and, like, killed two people before they smashed all the equipment. Wow. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if this is for realsies or it's, you know, uh, somebody, yeah. you know, well, pulling a hoax or propose, if this yeah. is, like, dead <laughs> who stare at goats where it's something that it was designed to confuse people during the Cold War and now it's being taken seriously or, like, whatever it is. Yeah. But... 
Yeah, I would to not debate if that actually happened, but the story is basically what happens in the show, for sure. Yeah, I mean, either way, I think in the show, what is happening, uh, to me at least, it's, rep it's presented as real. Yeah. Like, this is a reality. There's no, like, fans labyrinth, like, it, what is it? Did it happen? Wow. Did the monster exist? Did it not? Like, yeah. this is real. Like, yeah, I agree as well. <gasps> Japan's labyrinth? Oh, Separate conversation. Yeah, but yeah, don't get into that either. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so well, and to me, it's more and and so that's why I'm marking back to what you were saying before. Um, to me, in the show, it was supposed to be about sci-fi because they are selling that there's some sort of science to it, and it just actually kind of looks like a an alternate dimension, even though the justification that are science uh, science fictiony. Uh, kind of relate more of magic uh, at a bunch of different occasions. Yeah. So this is a very frequently I mean, it's early fantasy, but go on. Oh, I was just gonna say this. This is like a frequently misunderstood thing in cinema. Uh, you got science fiction, you got fantasy, you got science fiction setting, and you've got fantasy setting, right? The actual elements that define fantasy versus science fiction are not the things that most people think about. So, like, for example, this movie, which a lot of people have seen, and the movies that are connected to it. That's um, X-Men, right? Yeah. I see very well. <laughs> it's Star Wars. It's Star <laughs> okay. Wars. Hold on. I, I, have another, I have another prop here for you. Nice. Okay. That's there you go. That was the Millennium yeah, Falcon. Uh, that's uh, nice. It's almost impressive until your hand came through and saw the scale. Like we yeah, well, whatever. Uh, Star Wars, which a lot of people call the most famous, most popular science fiction movie of all time, not a science fiction movie. It's a fantasy movie in a science fiction setting, right? So, like, yeah, I can totally just gonna, this one. Yeah, I'm just gonna yeah. really, really quickly break this down for the the purposes of this conversation. Like, what are the elements that we have in Star Wars? Well, we've got a farm boy who's a part of a prophecy. He gets adopted, essentially, by uh, a wizard who tells him that he has to go on a quest to go to a big castle to rescue a princess from a dark knight. Mm -hmm. On the way, he meets a rogue and his mystical friend. Yeah. That's Star Wars in a nutshell, yeah, yeah. right? So yeah. Look, yeah. looking at it like that, it's very, very clear that Star Wars is a fantasy, but yeah. it just happens to be you know, a classic fantasy story told in a sci-fi setting. Well, well so, yeah. You know, use those same tools and, and break down this, this show. Yeah, this one has a tiny bit. Uh, yeah, it's got. It's a little more mixed in the sense that it's a lot about the an alternate dimension and things moving in and out of it. Um, so I don't know if that makes it any more because we you haven't defined what science fiction would be then then and there. Like science fiction is kind of uh, to me it would be uh, the plot and like the things you think about and the action stems from some some sort of scientific ish uh, concept and inventions and, and science kind of. I, don't I know. think well, this just in and out more honestly. Like even I agree with the the breakdown of um, a fantasy. It's like a fantasy show framed in a sci fi se science fiction setting. But I think it does kind of dip a little bit into that, especially you know with the actual kind of science behind like reaching that other dimension and, and using these children that have some pieces and all that stuff, I think. But we don't hear any of the science. Yeah. We never find out anything about how it works. It is essentially magic, which is why part of the reason why I say it's a fantasy. Also, that under dimension, it's essentially the underworld, right? Like, they, they go into hell is where they go. They don't go to another alternate dimension where they, they find alternate versions of themselves and, you know, like... Uh, like the multiverse theory or anything based on any kind of real science or even science that yeah. makes sense within the context of the show, they really just go to like a hellish underworld that has like dark mirror yeah. versions of. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mostly sold on this. I, I, the last thing uh, I can arc back, but I don't think it's been done in a very systematic and explained way is, is how much they uh, worked and trained Eleven as a, as an experiment, but. Um, I was actually one of the things that I was thinking about uh, the the I guess the um, bad guys the enemies in this thing is 
motivations are not m be made very clear they kind of do what they do because they're obsessed with what they're doing and they're kind of evil but you don't you don't really get to to hear that much from them either they just kind of keep on doing what they're doing but she um, essentially serves as like the human sacrifice right or like the the medium if you want to put it in in fantasy terms she serves as a medium to these beings in this space on the other side. And we never find out how it works. We just know that she's a part of this, yeah. what essentially amounts to a dark ritual. Yeah. Right? And yeah. they even go out of their way to point out to us that this is a fantasy story by using the Dungeons and Dragons like characters and names, right? We got the Demi Gorgon, yeah. right? We don't have an alien. We don't have a, 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 a beast that's an ancient dinosaur that's been revived. We have a demigorgon, a mystical creature, that is that is chasing her down. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I'm sold on this too. I can I can see that. Yeah, uh, I I guess actually, if anything, it could be that um, they um, they tried and and kind of uh, justify a little bit of their their entire storyline with uh, some science fiction, so that well, some science ish kind of element so that uh, the entire thing is not just magic everywhere so that people don't completely uh, become uh, you know anti it or, or don't like it as much yeah well, I wonder I mean I wonder if that was the motivation or I wonder if it's a little bit more I mean I, if you think about it the, there is a lot of like weird articles and weird kind of news that comes out about like crazy experiments that we did in the 80s with LSD and all this crazy stuff so I think to like kind of go back to like the eighties stuff and tie that in into yeah. this fantasy world yeah. that I mean I think some of it's kind of cool. Yeah. I don't know if it's just so much as oh yeah, let's yeah, put it. Yeah. Plus the opposite of this would be like they they run into some sort of cult and they actually go to hell and that's a different story and that's that's just not yeah, that's just yeah, not that's what nowhere near looking at either. I mean just to give one more example of this, like citing something that we've been talking about. Uh, Alien is not really a sci-fi movie either. It's really, it's a haunted house movie. It's, it's a very classic haunted house horror movie that is in a sci-fi setting. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things that are commonly discussed as being sci-fi are, are really not sci-fi. In order to be classified as like what like hardcore nerds would consider it sci-fi, it has to be like pretty heavy-handed in terms of social... Uh, social commentary, it has to be like really large scale, you know, you, you really need to be able to pull back stuff and see like how has science affected this story? How has science created this new fictional universe? And like, we don't really see that in so, this, right? uh, Alien sort of, sort of has like biology themes uh, in between, in, in but yeah, it's, it's, most, it's largely a, a slasher horror movie in space. Yeah. Do you guys remember the scene with with um, Will with Will um, Byer when they found him? When I said that it reminded this reminded me of Alien, and I felt like the whole time the show was kind of the creepy parts were like a, the upside down world. I like, felt multiple times was giving a nod to the Alien movies. Yeah, they found him and he had that thing in his mouth. Oh I yeah! Think. Oh absolutely! Yeah. Like, absolutely! No question! Yeah. No question! Yeah. It's like it was like leading up to it, right? And I kept thinking about it. And I kept thinking, oh, it's like making me think of that. And then they just they showed him with that thing in his mouth, and it was and yeah. like cocooned in those pods, just, and, which uh, actually they have pods very very similar to those in Alien Insurrection, which is the one that Winona is in. Just saying. Uh, 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 on that end, it, it felt that it was a. Sometimes it feels a little bit like uh, there is a mix of genres as well. Like I wasn't particularly expecting the way. So first, I still. At first, at least, I was fooled into like, well, there is science experiment. Uh, maybe it's kind of science fictiony, etc. And then uh, it becomes more kind of uh, esoterical, magical, alternate dimension things happening on a scale that doesn't sound or feel like science at all. Um, even though they still, I mean, they're still pretending that there is science to it. They just don't get into details at all whatsoever. Uh, and then you start seeing like. Um, monsters that don't just kill you but they kind of eat you they kind of eat you uh, use your body to, to you know like the whole like alien per side kind of thing and this one was like okay that's that's yet another sort of angle that i wasn't expecting to this thing you know because when they get jumped by big monsters you kind of more expect them to get 
killed or, or something bad to happen. But when they get uh, used and put in cocoons and and etc etc, it kind of feels like a it's it's kind of a different aspect of the monster that I wasn't quite expecting uh, with the rest of the tone of the of the TV show. Uh, that felt natural to you. Can you say more? Like, what what do you mean? You you expected them to just kind of be like like killed off like in a, a slasher film until there was only some like one or two people left. Well. I guess I'm, I, I might need to get more into my thought to, to have a solid theory, but I guess, yeah, um, my first thought would be this, yeah, because, like I say, the, the fact that he, that he turns into a parasite, a parasitic, uh, uh, use the human body for a host and kind of very alien-y is, is kind of a different theme to me, like that, and that they don't really get into either. I think it's more just of a plot device to actually not have to kill them off and, and be like, oh, look, they are mm, they could die, but they're really actually in a cocoon and you can go save them. Right. Um, it's a way to ramp up their level of jeopardy without crossing them over into death. Yeah. And I don't, yeah, I don't really know that, like, the point was ever, like, what is this thing anyways? But, like, yeah, I think it's this, like, this, like, mortal danger that's looming over these children at all times. And... In that sense, like I think we should talk about Barb a little bit because I think it's really interesting because I don't know. You just think they're all going to be safe? No. I'm, yeah. Um, can we can we enter into my uh, my my topic about the, the movie within the movie? Yeah, yeah right. I kind of I kind of feel like we should uh, rant about Barb as everybody has done more towards the end of it, but we're 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 getting there. Also, um, yeah, maybe we can discuss this when we get to Barb, but the internet loves her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so what? What else? Oh, yeah, I, I, and I'll say as well. Like uh, again, need picky the the telekinetic uh, ability, like all the the powers, kind of that Eleven uh, develops uh, as she 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 serves. Uh, um, uh, she's the medium uh, in this facility. Um, yeah, that also kind of feels like another kind of aspects that doesn't. There is a there is an alternate world. There is a monster. Uh, there is there is you know people disappearing, and then there's also that girl who not only can cross uh, the barrier. Like she could just be limited to this. Like she could be the the person who's the link between the worlds and can see and can touch and whatever. But now she actually has a whole bunch of a whole slew of of basically superpowers. So it's not she's, jarring, she's, but it's... She's getting stronger, right? She's ramping up. She's getting stronger. Yeah. I mean, like, think of, like, Carrie. Think of the Carrie, like, you know, Stephen King's Carrie. Like, she starts out kind of weak, discovering her telekinetic powers, and by the end of it, it's like she's capable of such extreme violence. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying... I mean, I'm just saying it's, it's like, it's another type of... Like, they could all be a movie, you know? They could be the movie about the, the alternate dimension, the movie about the monster... The movie about alien uh, hosts uh, inside uh, human bodies, and then a movie about somebody who can uh, who has who has the like kinetic powers. Then that she didn't have to uh, to have all those powers. Oh yeah, it's I mean it's a hodgepodge of like nods to different genres and different things for sure. I was trying to find right now um, one of the articles I was reading like used a really good word to describe it. It's like a med like a medley or something. I don't know. Was no medley. But, I mean, it was, like, better, even better said. Oh, okay. It's definitely, like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a mishmash of, you know, it's, like, this horror elements. There is science fiction elements, whether it's just in the frame and the setting or, you know, however you want to take it. There's definitely supernatural. There's fantasy. I mean, there's all kinds of, like, stuff going on. But it's, it's done so well, and it's, like, rep and, you know, it's kind of all baked into this, like, frame of 80s pop culture. And I think that's what makes it so awesome. It's just done really well. Yeah. It just if, I think if it picked one or two and then stuck to it, it wouldn't be as it wouldn't be as well received. Well, I also feel like if you added one more, I would be like, okay, this is just a mess. Like if you <laughs> added a robot somewhere in there, I would be like, <laughs> or I don't know. <laughs> can we um can we go back a little bit though? I want to talk a little bit if if we're done here about um, what Eric was. Uh, we were kind of starting to talk about with this like theme with like Barb and what happened to her and like these children. I yeah. Danger I guess that so, if you really want so, to go to Barbara. So this, this was my main topic that I wanted to talk to you guys about tonight, right? So, like, as I watched this movie, 
it became more and more apparent that there are re so, man movie we we all keep doing it we all keep calling it a movie yeah. as I watched this show I, I became more and more fascinated and interested in this this notion that there's kind of like a show within a show you know um, so like let's talk about the source material yeah. the source material is ET it's Flight of the Navigator. That's the one I couldn't remember before. It's The Goonies. It's, you know, um, I don't, even something like Home Alone, you know, although that's technically 90s. But like all of these action movies that surround kids getting in over their heads in something that is really an adult problem. Meanwhile, the adults, like, oh, you know, sort of parents just don't understand typical yeah. stuff. But you never feel like the kids are in mortal danger, right? right? Like wh when you watch ET, never for a second do you think that the main character guy is gonna die. He gets super sick, but you're never really worried about him. In the Goonies, you know, oh, what's no, up? Mark, with the cinematography element of like it's so obviously like a movie, it's a film, and you just know that like you know this they're untouchable. Like things are gonna happen, ups and downs, but they're gonna come out safe. Right, but so what's interesting about this is that it makes no frickin' sense, right? So like in E.T., they're being chased by people from the government. They're dealing with a biological entity from another world. In the Goonies, they're being chased by hardened criminals that have no problem shooting at and trying to kill other people that have kept like their mutant sibling locked up and tortured him for decades, right? Like, in all of these movies, there is real danger that is never perceived by the audience. And I think that's because when we are seeing E.T., we're seeing it really through the eyes of, I think the main character's name is Daniel. Right? We're seeing it through the kids' eyes. When we see the Goonies, it's about the kids. We're seeing it through their eyes. And kids have this like, feeling of immortality about them because they, have, they just haven't realized their own mortality yet. Mm -hmm. But in Stranger Things, we get that. Right? We have these kids that are clearly in over their head. They're dealing with a freaking crazy monster from another dimension. They have this telepath friend. They never really take seriously how much of a threat she is to them. You know, like, they have this petty squabble about how one kid wants to like, leave the club, basically. But not really because he's like, ah! Like, you know, he die. comes <laughs> back. They're able to talk him into coming back and hanging out with this telepath who's going to explode their brains. Right? But... The adults have a completely different spin on the situation, right? Like, the mom is freaking out the entire time. The entire town is searching for this missing kid. Yeah. The teenagers, meanwhile, have sort of this, like, storyline that happens in between the two, where, like, they don't really take it seriously. The older sister doesn't take it seriously at all. And then you know what happens? Barb dies. Barb lose it, like, is gone. And all of a sudden, the sister transitions from kid world to adult world. And we, we literally get to watch her go from being like, well, well, well I'm going to go make out with my boyfriend, you know, to being like, I'm going to change boyfriends to the boyfriend who's going to help me hunt down and kill this thing. Right? We, like, we see her shift from these two storylines. And what's interesting to me is, right, to me, I'm, I'm seeing this whole thing in the context of 80s, 2016. The adult storyline is very 2016, right? Like, all of our TV shows, all of our movies, all of our everything, everybody's always in mortal danger. You never know who's going to die. Anybody could die at any minute, right? The, the most popular show on TV right now is Game of Thrones, which is infamous for just, like, killing people off left and right. Yeah. And so what we're really seeing is we're seeing her mature, not just from her childhood into adulthood, but we're seeing her mature through, like, our cinematic childhood into our cinematic adulthood. She, like, transitions from, from 1984 or, like, 1985 story to, like, 2016 story. So anyway, that's my theory. I'm, I put it out for discussion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um... Yeah, the parents are definitely freaking out. The parents are the only ones who are who are just having a sense of somebody is actually missing, and most people are convinced he's actually dead, and and the whole thing revolves around her completely refusing to believe this and being convinced that he is not, anyways. Um, 
There's a few things, right? So, like, I wonder, I mean, it's just, like, for us to discuss. I mean, so, yeah, you know, definitely, like, well-thought-out theory there. But, like, so with Barb, with her getting killed, like, what does that say, you know? Does that say, like, at a certain point, you know, like, at this age now, you're no longer within this realm of eternal protection. You've, like, surpassed it. You're actually in this adult world where you're, you know, where you're mortal and it's really real that you could just die and the world can envelop you and just kill you off. Because because the, the kid that gets lost, right, Will has been in that world much longer than Barb has, and yet he survives it. Yeah. He comes out of it, you know, I mean, he's not unscathed, but he comes right, he comes out of it. Yeah, this this, this whole thing threw, threw me for a bunch of spins, right, because you would think, okay, uh, 80s settings, Goonies, etc., no kid is going to die, and then shortly after when when the kid does disappear or when you start seeing how bad the monster is from the other dimension you're like god he's dead the demogorgon is just i just snatch him and he's dead um uh but then but then i mean it becomes obvious obvious that uh you uh we're gonna find that we're gonna find him again um and then since you absolutely refuse to let that one go we're gonna talk about barb um oh, I can't believe it like I mean it just killed her and it was crazy. She said it. Uh um, first. Uh huh. <laughs> was it crazy? I mean like I mean I it's not it, like, it, oh my god, how could they? But it's you know, they, they went there and they drew this they they drew some kind of line, right? Like you've got these children, you've got these adults, and then you've got these like teenagers that in that are in the middle. And you know they drew this line like here and up is like there's no like immortal like safety net around you. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're up for grabs. Here's a question: Is Barb actually a character, or is she just a plot device? Well, it's just the thing. Like, and Take I that. think they made her. <laughs> I think they made her too nice a person, and she got completely. She was kind of an underdog, and and she she got she got completely dismissed by her friend. Like she, they they made her into a lovable character, um, and not only they not only she got killed off, but she really got just tossed away to the monster and completely dismissed and ignored to the point where you actually I actually do wonder what is the message. Uh, I I I almost kind of doubt they didn't know what they were doing. Either there is deleted That's scenes. What? No, I totally agree with you. Like, I mean, because really, she's like nothing to her. She's literally like her character is placed there so that like she will die in the upside she, down. She she's placed there so that she will die so that she can create the impetus for the sister character to mature. She's the motivation for the entire character change of all the other main teenager characters, right? And like, never a single time in the story does barb as far as i remember does barb interact with the children characters i don't know that barb interacts with any adult characters no she, either. she's not in many scenes at all no. right yeah, so the only people that she has any influence on the only she people she does who... interact with the children doesn't she interact with will in the upside down world at one point no she gets killed no right she's off. dead no, 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 I know she's dead, but at some point, when before she's running around and the monster catches her, I think there's a moment where he, they're together. She's not running around, she gets killed in the swimming pool. Yeah, she's dead before she even gets in there. She gets eaten in the swimming pool. No, I know Not that. even really eaten, because we see her body is still whole. She just gets mauled. Yeah, the monster she gets just whatever. Kills her. Okay, you guys discuss. I'm going to look this up for a second. No, there's a scene where she gets jumped. And she gets mauled inside the swimming pool. She get she get pulled away by the monster inside I right that. then. Right yeah, then. I knew that. And then she's in the upside down world. No. Well, anyways. Yeah. Um I, I honestly I think she just exists to send the message to the teenagers that they're not immortal. She exists for to to create the impetus for them to change. Yeah, possibly. Or maybe maybe that's what they Maybe they didn't realize that they were building too much of a character for that. I, I just feel like they, I mean, the reason everybody's freaking out is that they made a, a nice friend 
uh, she's like taking care of her friend. She's being neglected by her friend, which uh, um, allegedly, yes, is is a way for the other. Uh, I don't know what's what's her name to realize she needs to mature because she was mistreating her friend or whatever, neglecting her and doing other things that were that were uh, frivolous while her friend was just alone getting killed. But they he, doing that, they just created this character who's like <laughs> who's actually like nice and people like kind of rooted for. And she's not as cool, and you know she's got all the traits of the of the character that's actually interesting and or or actually uh, uh, not just the popular person that's kind of boring or whatever, like the the cool character, and she gets completely killed, uh, uh, like right then and there. You even uh, they even talk to her parent and her family and like you get this this flash of like oh my god this is horrible like her mom is pretending she's home but she's really not she's gonna freak out like the other one expect her kid is actually dead and will not come back and right. then never again never again and and the only thing you get like for for a few episodes you're like shit bart is dead nobody's really saying anything and then at the very end uh the teenager is like kind of sad and you feel like she's thinking about barb but like for five seconds at the end of the tv show basically well what's funny is that barb is like not really a character she's really just this this mechanism and yet we can't remember her counterpart's name we none of us remember the name of the sister we sure. all remember barb yeah yeah i don't know if it's from the probably probably from the tv show and also from the from just the backlash of her, all the internet but yeah uh yeah because the i mean yeah the 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 sister is just kind of this generic uh, you know, a young teen discovering life, kind of, kind of shy and getting a boyfriend, getting kind of too cool for a friend, and yeah, she's just that. She's really, and she steps up. But even when she steps up, it's I think it's kind of like that in the Goonies as well, right? The teenagers are kind of just um, making out with each other or just pursuing romance and etc. Right. And they're much less cool than the, the smaller kids. Like they're kind of like stepping up and doing the the body work sometimes when you need to be a little bigger, but they're not nearly as cool as the small ones. Right. Yeah. It's all about the small kids. And and why are they not as cool? Because Purity. the kids have no notion that they're in any danger, so they're just yeah. like, yeah, let's like go find the pirate ship. Let's like take on these robbers. Let's like swing from this rope. You know, like the kids just have no no sense of self-preservation whatsoever and because of that they're like they're actually really cool yeah, <laughs> they like take all these insane risks i feel yeah. like it's even highlighted even more because it's so juxtaposed with like in within the same you know within like one cut to another cut within this show we see like their total careless like oh, let's go let's hop on our bikes and go and then we see like the, the real mortal danger from like the adult mom's perspective or like the crazy scientist's perspective and you know you're like oh shit this is real i'm so glad you said bikes bikes let's oh, talk yeah. about this yeah. when have you ever seen outside of an 80s action movie that's targeted at young people and families have you ever seen a group of people riding around on bikes as a part of an action film yeah yeah <laughs> totally that's it's like the most hardcore 80s kids movie trope ever, right? right? Because it's just like the epitome of this whole mindset of like parents just don't understand, right? Because like you can go places, first of all, adults don't really ride bikes that much in terms of like the minds of kids, especially in the 80s, right? Like adults don't really ride bikes. That's a thing that you do before you're old enough for a car. So it's, it's a specific domain of kids. Plus... You can be in a car chase with a car chasing you on a bike, but if you're on a bike, you might not be able to go as fast, but you, you can go places that cars can, right? Yep. And like the, the way that they did the bike chase in this show was just 100% E.T. Like, I was thinking about, I, I have in the past, I've made these like shot for shot articles where I, I show side by side how the cinematography is exactly the same. The cinematography in the bike chase is just like, E.T., right? I mean, everything about it is straight out of E.T., yeah. and they, they executed it perfectly. I mean, yeah, um, the mere fact that there is a bike chase, just a throwback that's pretty pretty hard to, to the E.T. The whole specifically, thing. a bike chase with a bunch of boys on bikes 
Thanks. And they yeah. also yeah. have a telekinetic character with them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is there anything more you guys, you know, want to say on this? Did you have like other things you wanted to discuss? My only other thing that I, I wanted to that discuss I wanted. is uh, uh, do you guys think yeah, the think next season next is going to be the um, um, a continuation of this storyline, or do you think we're going to get a completely get different story, story that takes place inside the Stranger Things like, universe? Like, yeah. more like, uh, like Twilight Zone, yeah. but on a season-by-season so, season basis instead of an episode-by-episode episode basis. Ominous, what do you think? There, there. I think, uh, Tanisha, you should mute when, when you're not talking, because it's probably coming from the side. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the, um, there is the, there is the whole ending of the TV show, I guess, that was, um, um, that was kind of an open door to to more of the of the storyline happening and uh, the multiple world. Um. Yeah, but I think it's gonna be like personally. I feel very strongly. We'll see. I hope I'm wrong because I'd like to see where this story goes. But maybe it would just get dragged out anyways. I think that um, they left. You know, the way it ended with him leaving. Um, leaving that. What is it? It's like a. The sandwich, like a peanut butter and jelly, that that Eleven likes. I think that that's just it. I think that this is the end of that story, and I think season two is going to be something else within this world. Kind oh, of I like completely forgot that she kind of she kind of disappears, does she? Yeah, yeah, I mean she sacrifices herself. Kind of. The ending basically alludes that she's possibly still around. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's hard it's hard to say, right? It's hard to say if it's like a like a gesture the way you leave flowers on a grave. Yeah, that's not what I was thinking about. I was thinking about the the fact that um, Will in his bathroom uh, has a bunch of kind of bits of the underworld monster still with him. Like he kind right. of just uh, gets some go in the sink when he's brushing his teeth or something. And uh, it's clearly not the first time that it's happened, right? Because he's like totally cool about it. Yeah, yeah. Was he cool about it? I thought he was freaked out. He just didn't want to. Well, he's he's, he's not the first time he sees it. I don't want or whichever, yeah, anyways. Um, yeah, it, it, it could really be either. I, honestly, I I would probably, I hope, and I don't partially think they would do another one in this setting because it's been done and it's never going to be as weird, special, different um, again. Special is the right word because they could make it as good, you know, or good enough. No, but I don't it was think so. like so special. I don't think they could at all. I mean, like, what is it going to be? Like, it's going to be the same kids, and now they go they go back to the dimension and try and get the monster, or somebody else disappears, or. Well, but or it some... doesn't. It doesn't have to be right. It could be some other kids from their school, and, you know, it's still happening in this town, and and like we don't know what other effects there were. Or well, they have to go get eleven or something. Like they have to somewhere. go get eleven. They have to deal with what's going on with the kid. Yeah. They left the relationship status totally open. We know there's this sexual tension and romantic tension between sheriff and mom character. If this was an eighties movie, in the last scene they would have been, you know, shown like like this. You know, yeah. we don't really well, that's don't not a reason really for a TV series. <laughs> um you know, there, there's a lot of new ground to explore, yeah. and there's a lot of crazy stuff that's gone down. Yeah, but for it know? to be interesting enough is what I'm, I'm kind of dubious of. Yeah, I don't know. My gut just says it's going to be a different, different story. Like, I personally I, hope so. Um, I think they would have a hard time um, doing away with the characters because they found some actors that are working very well. And totally gonna say that. If they if they end up pulling a um, how was it called True Detective season two, that's gonna be like the saddest. The saddest. But so sad. I'm having a hard time seeing a second. There's a lot of this that feels uh, like a one-off storyline to me. I'm. But, I'm but also yeah. keep in mind, True Detective season two was not nearly as good and not nearly as well received. Oh, that's what I was hinting at. Yeah, that is, yeah, that it would no, be miserable. It'd be so sad. Disaster. Season two was like a disaster. Yeah, yeah. Probably more people would rather see this this story and these characters get dragged out until it's not fun anymore than not ever see it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's it's possible. I'm I'm just saying I, I'm having a hard time 
being excited by the season two, or at least I'm seeing a season two that will be not nearly as uh, exciting. Well, but. in the meantime, we can rewatch season one. I honestly think that, like, I honestly, I'm I'm going to rewatch it because I think that uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff that we would catch. Like when I was looking for whether whether Will and Barb ever interacted in the underworld, I found this thing on Reddit where someone put together. There's a walking sequence of Eleven and just her footsteps and the way she's walking in the woods, and then that's in episode one, and then in episode seven they have her in the once she's in her whatever alternate dimension and it's completely black when she finds Barb's dead body, um, and she's walking and it's the exact same foot pattern. So I mean it's just like little little things like that. I bet you the show is littered with that. I think it'd be cool to watch it like closely, yeah. since. I binge watched the whole show in one sitting. I think I probably missed things. Yeah, for sure. I, I forced myself to spread it out over like three days, but yeah. Yeah, I think I think this whole this whole stream has made me rewatch. Maybe that is what's happening this weekend. <laughs> yeah, there'll definitely be more, more details in there for you, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, which I I'm just going to throw it out there because it's the second time I'm 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 being reminded of it, but. I thought there was some of the construction that was that would kind of ex file to me, and I do uh, uh, think every now and then of Twin Peaks as well. In, oh yeah, we talked about that. Uh, maybe just in the eeriness of the the whatever re uh, weird magical thing is going on, or it's in like the many the details. Small, it's more the quaint town. It's the quaint feeling for me. Twin Peaks has this like sense of like bizarre quaintness like you know something weird's going on in this mm -hmm. like little town and then this like show has the same vibe and feel yeah I think it's a vibe thing would you have yeah. preferred uh if uh we are not writer freaked out the way uh uh laura's dad and mom freak out when she disappears in twin peaks would that be she more in tone for you did. she practically did <laughs> she practically did i don't know i don't think anybody will ever top the the uh, yeah, reaction of the parents in Twin Peaks. That's that's <laughs> up there. There's a quite high bar. There, yeah, they've set a high bar for parental freakouts. Cool. So, <laughs> all right. So, well, you you basically love all of it. There is nothing you want to complain about that you that you're. It's your last opportunity to to uh, rant or complain about anything of the show. So you 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 mostly basically 100 percent love it. Love it. Monster loves it. The heart. I gave it two laser blasts. Two? That's your maximum. <laughs> uh, no, I guess I give it. I give it ten. I give it a ton of laser blasts. <laughs> okay. I think you're gonna give someone a seizure. Is what you're gonna do. <laughs> this isn't a well-developed. I uh, give it scale. a seizure. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Good. Well. Yeah. I... <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions. I don't know if there's anything like that. But um, no, I have nothing more to nothing say on that other than I'm gonna rewatch it. No, I yeah. was thinking of like two thumbs up, you know. Like, two, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't really give it more than two thumbs up if you're. Kind if you're of flexible enough, average. you could put a feet, I guess. You could. Well, that's why two laser blasts. Two laser blasts up. All right, that's cool. That works. Um, and I, yeah, I, I find all my nitpick throughout the show, but but over and all, uh, mostly really liked and enjoyed the show. So, awesome. Um, cool. Well, that's it for for this one then. Um, quickly, uh, there has been a trailer, but there's nothing about Stranger Things season two that's actually being told. Other than I actually think we've seen some some uh, um, references to the first uh, to to elements of the first season, like they say the shed, the whatever, the friend. So it, they might actually be hinting of uh, getting into the the same universe. If you wanna if you wanna see more look up uh, Stranger Things trailer 2 or look up the beginning of the show where I completely showed the trailer for season 2 instead of the trailer for season 1 uh, mm -hmm. nothing much out there anyways it's it's very uh, very high P not, not that many details at all about it okay cool so that's it for the show um, I uh, well do, do you want to plug anything uh, uh, Tans do you have any uh, advertising oh, no advertising I'm good you can yeah, there you go. All right. Uh, what about you, Eric? 
Uh, I guess the one thing I have to hype is that I am the uh, the founder of a company called Sprawly, and uh, my obsession with cinema Ooh. knows no bounds. I have built this tool for building cinematic interactive VR experiences. If you are interested in that in any way, shape, or form, whether you want to make stuff or see stuff, you can go to Sprawly, S-P-R-A-W-L-Y dot C-O, and learn all about making interactive cinematic VR experiences. That does sound cool. I'll add some uh, some links to this uh, to this show as well. Uh, awesome. I'm gonna go straight there. Uh, cool. And yeah, I'm Ominous. Uh, this has been episode three of the Responsibles for Responsible Gaming. Um, we'll see you next time for God knows what episode four. Um, so yeah, see you next time. And until then, play responsibly. Bye, everybody.